picturesque and maybe even familiar farm scene. Except the tractor being used here has a less common power source, it's electric. Boogie, woogie, woogie. It's been developed and put to work at a dairy farm in Germany. The makers of the e-tractor are hoping it'll be for sale in small numbers by the end of next year and possibly replace conventional tractors down the road. It's designed to be more environmentally friendly than diesel machines, but the electric one does have some drawbacks. The first is cost. Its makers say it'll be about 35% more expensive than diesel tractors, and that's as long as a German government program stays in place to help pay for it. Developers say the e-tractor is less expensive to operate though, so the additional price will even out after about five to eight years based on average farm use, and that it'll save farmers money after that. One other drawback is that it's not as powerful as diesel engines. So while the e-tractor can handle a lot of everyday work, it's not capable of plowing or regular operation with heavy machinery. Still, it's another example of how people are exploring new energy sources for vehicles used in everyday life. Hi, I'm Carl Azus, thankful to be starting off a new week with the best audience in news. Welcome to the world from A to Z, your nonpartisan source for international events. Here's what's next this Monday. There's been an outbreak of E. coli infections in America. E. coli standing for Escherichia coli. It's a bacteria that naturally lives in the intestines of healthy people and animals, but can be very dangerous if it's ingested. At least 75 people across 13 different states have been infected with a strain of E. coli. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control says the outbreak's been linked to some of McDonald's quarter pounder burgers and probably from the onions used to make them. The company that supplies McDonald's onions has issued a recall. Burger King, KFC, Pizza Hut and Taco Bell have also taken action even though they're not connected to the cases of infection. Some of their locations have thrown out any suspicious onions or removed them from the menu to help ensure their food is safe. The majority of the people who've gotten sick starting in late September and continuing through the earlier part of this month have not been hospitalized, but more than 20 have been. A lawsuit's been filed against McDonald's and health officials as well as the company itself are working to address the issue. A health alert coming for the Golden Arches. Oh, sorry, we don't have the quarter pounders at the moment. The CDC is conducting what they're calling a fast moving investigation into an E. coli outbreak they say is linked to the popular McDonald's quarter pounder and dozens of illnesses reported, including one death of an older person. A map on the CDC website shows most of the illnesses are in Colorado and Nebraska. We reach out to members of the public that have these, po these positive test results and ask them a series of food survey type questions to try and understand foods that they ate leading up to the onset of their illness. Information reviewed by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration shows that slivered onions are a likely source of contamination. In a video released on YouTube, McDonald's USA President Joe Erlinger says McDonald's has stopped using the onions as well as quarter pound beef patties in several states while the investigation continues. In an interview with the Today Show, Erlinger assured customers that other items on the menu are safe to eat. What we've done at McDonald's has taken um, this swift and decisive action uh, to address um, uh, the issue that we have um, so that uh, uh, the, the, the public can be confident in McDonald's. In New York, Lee Waldman reporting. Bird and knowledge. Who was U.S. president when the Statue of Liberty was unveiled in 1886? James A. Garfield, Chester A. Arthur, Grover Cleveland, William McKinley. Serving the first of his two non-consecutive terms was President Grover Cleveland. On this date in world history. It was on October 28th in 1886 that the Statue of Liberty enlightening the world, its full official name, was presented to the American public. The French gift of friendship to the United States was cheered at its unveiling by an estimated one million people in New York, and President Grover Cleveland presided over the ceremony. One of the most dangerous events of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union came to an end on October 28, 1962. 
Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev announced that his nation's missiles would be removed from Cuba after the United States promised it wouldn't attack Cuba and that the U.S. was planning to remove some of its missiles from Turkey. Diplomatic efforts between the two Cold War enemies increased after the Cuban Missile Crisis was over. First time in history, these three schools have been announced on the world from A to Z. From South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, we've got the Pirates watching in Coach Phillips' class. Great to see everyone at South Pittsburgh High School in the Volunteer State. The Bay State of Massachusetts is our next stop. Mrs. Ballas' class, we see you at Hale Middle School. Hello to the town of Stoke. And Newman Grove Public Schools are in the city of Newman Grove, Nebraska. Mr. McLeod's class is there. We're thankful to have you watching from the Cornhusker State. Hey! Did you know a presidential candidate needs 270 electoral votes to win? The states with the most are California, Texas, Florida, and New York. For more, check out the Electoral College map at periodicpresidents.com. Welcome to Electoral College. Our first class, how to elect a president. With just two exceptions, all our states appoint electors who are pledged to whichever candidate receives the most votes in their state. California has by far the biggest population, and so it gets to choose the most electors. Seven states plus the District of Columbia choose the minimum number, and that's three. Whatever candidate receives 270 or more electoral votes wins. Originally, these electors were supposed to use their own good judgment about picking a president. Citizens knew and trusted these electors better than they knew the candidates running. States set their own rules for choosing electors. Over time and with more influence from political parties, states moved to winner-take-all elections. The states of Maine and Nebraska choose electors a little differently. The system is important because out of the 120 million or more ballots voters will cast this fall, the election could come down to just a handful of electoral votes. So how do Maine and Nebraska choose electors differently? Simply put, they divvy them up. Maine has a total of four electoral votes. Nebraska has five. If a candidate wins the popular vote in one or more congressional districts, but not overall in the state, that candidate can still get an electoral vote or two in Maine. He or she can get as many as three in Nebraska. This system, like the winner-take-all system of other states, like the Electoral College itself, is controversial. But for decades, they've been part of the election process in America. Please keep it here over the next week because we'll have regular coverage of topics related to the 2024 U.S. presidential election. Take a look at a look at the universe that represents just a tiny piece of an astronomically large puzzle. The European Space Agency's Euclid Telescope, launched in 2023, has been capturing countless images of stars and galaxies as a part of a ginormous mission to create the largest and most accurate 3D map of the cosmos. What you are seeing here is the newly released first piece of the puzzle. In the photo mosaic, which mapped a sliver of the Earth's southern hemisphere sky, roughly 100 million stars and galaxies are featured, including an in-depth zoom in, highlighting a far-off spiral galaxy. To give you an idea of how big the effort is, this sliver of sky represents only 1% of a map that will take six years to complete, and even then will only cover one-third of the sky. With Halloween lurking just a few days from now, we thought we'd show you a very unique take on an outdoor display that doesn't just utilize a pumpkin, it utilizes its guts. A very creative man from Iowa found inspiration in a pumpkin's innards and positioned them outwardly all over his home. The goop, the seeds, the dinky carving knife that's infamous for breaking, it's all part of his alternative interpretation of Halloween decoration. Everyday pumpkin displays don't hold a candle to that. If you prefer goopy over spooky, you like your seeds posted more than roasted, you've got the guts and the slime and can carve out the time because you care and dare to pull pear something truly extraordinary. All you need is the skill that stems from a pump can do attitude. I'm Carl Azuz, farming punkins on the world from A to Z, and thank you for taking the time to watch our show. You mean the world to me.